Alright guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Today I'm in something quite special. It's this Lexus LC500. And I've got a bit of a confession to make. In fact, let me tell you how the day started. I drove into town for a bit of breakfast and a coffee on my way to go and get this Lexus LC. I sat there eating my eggs on toast, drinking my latte, whilst jotting down some bullet points about the LC500. Because I'm a car geek, I know a bit about most cars, so I thought I had the LC figured out. I thought I knew exactly what it was and what it was all about. I thought it was a big, heavy, inert gentleman's express. Nicely finished, I'm sure, but ultimately not. Just a pleasant way of cocooning oneself from the gritty, unpleasant outside world. I thought the LC was a CL, basically. I was planning to tell you that it was a great way of getting from the golf club to the Masonic Hall. I was planning to tell you that this was a car only bought by retired accountants. I was planning to tell you that this was a car that you'd buy solely with your head and not your heart. Then I finally got behind the wheel and realised it was wrong. So wrong, in fact, I had to tear up the old script and start all over again. It's some motor car, this. This is what I love about cars most, their ability to constantly surprise you. I thought I had this car all sussed out, and I didn't. I borrowed this car from a viewer who kindly got in touch to see if I fancied driving their LC500 around the beautiful plains of Cheshire on a nice sunny day. So obviously I said I've got to go and check my diary first. And in the end I thought, mm, Go on then, you twisted my arm. I've been keen to get behind the wheel of an LC500 since they first came out back in 2017. Every time I see one on the road, which isn't that often, I always do a double take. It's so eye-catching. I think what we have here, ladies and gentlemen, is the perfect GT car. The LC, which stands for Luxury Coupe, was first seen at the 2016 Detroit Motor Show, and then it was finally on sale a year later. In theory, it was the long overdue replacement for the Lexus SC, which ended production in 2010. That's probably what threw me off with this car, because as much as I like the SC, it is a big, inert, heavy, gentleman's cruiser. And this isn't. This feels like a muscle car, albeit a muscle car with manners. You just don't expect this noise and this performance from a Lexus. Styling-wise, there's no two ways about it. It's a striking-looking car, this, from every angle. It looks like it's driven straight off the set of a sci-fi film. It's like looking at the future. And the convertible version's even better. Every time I look at it, I find something different that I haven't seen before. All right, being Japanese, it is a tad over style, but I genuinely think it works. I especially like them in that pearl white color they do. They just look interesting from every angle. For me, I think it's the rear that's a real triumph. To be fair, this metallic red over the tan interior is quite special too. The light interior and the nice glass roof help to make this car feel nice and bright. One thing I will say about the design, as great as it looks in 2022, I'm not sure how it will age. Because as interesting as it is, I'm not convinced it's pretty. You know, pretty in the same way that a Jaguar XK is, or an Aston Martin DB9, or even my AMG GT for that matter. I'm not sure how this will look in 15 or 20 years time. I really didn't expect this car to be so much fun to drive. Engine-wise, there were two options. There's the LC500, which I'm in today, which uses a 5-litre, 470 horsepower, naturally aspirated V8. Or there was the LC500H, which, as you can probably gather, is a hybrid. That one uses a 3.5-litre V6, plus electric motor and some batteries, and that produces about 360 horsepower. Interestingly, the hybrid wasn't really designed for tree-hugging reasons. The drivetrain was set up so that you could get more power out of the smaller V6. Something else that's interesting is they were both priced at the same price point when they were new. And I can't understand who would choose the hybrid over this glorious V8. Obviously there was a bit of a fuel saving with the hybrid, but if you're spending 80 or 90 thousand pounds on a car, fuel economy isn't really top of your list, is it? The 500H will average around 35 miles per gallon, whereas this 5 litre V8 will average around 24. Straight away I can tell you I've fallen head over heels in love with this V8. It's beautiful. It feels like a proper old-school V8. It's the same motor, in fact, you get in the ISF and the GSF, and it's a good one. So watch this, we're in Sports Plus mode now. My rev counter's gone all red and aggressive. As has the whole car. That's... That's seriously quick. Oh, there. Okay, I'll go back into normal mode, I think. All right, it's not as raw and visceral as my AMG GT, but it's, it's nearly there. It really is nearly there. Performance-wise, as you can probably tell by now, it's very good. 
it'll do 0 to 60 in around four and a half seconds and keep going until it gets to 168. What's funny, because it's naturally aspirated, low down, it feels quick enough, but nothing really happens until you get higher up the rev range. And then it goes a bit berserk. I honestly expected this car to feel about as sporty as an opera singer. And how wrong was I? We can safely put a tick next to the engine, but what about the gearbox? Because I'll be honest, again, I had my reservations. I thought, being a 10-speed automatic, it wouldn't be much of a driver's car. I thought it would be quite easily confused and a bit ponderous. It's a bit like going to a restaurant with a very long menu. You just sit there thinking, oh, shall I have that, or shall I go for that? Hmm, I don't know, what shall I do? Make up your mind. That's why I prefer a six-speed box over a 10. But, again, I'll have to admit I was wrong, because this box is very, very good. And the changes are quick and seamless. Occasionally, when you try and overtake something and you want to downshift, it can take a split second longer than you want, but I'm really splitting hairs. I also thought, being a Lexus, the soundproofing would be so good, you'd barely be able to hear that V8. Wrong again. Very wrong. I probably sound like a broken record now, but I can't believe I'm here, grinning ear to ear, in a Lexus. Most Lexus are boring hybrids that are bought by pensioners. Not the LC500 though. For a big heavy car, it changes direction incredibly quickly. Obviously it's front engine and rear wheel drive, but it handles brilliantly. Again, I know I've said this in many videos, but I'm not a trained motoring journalist. I'll just tell you what I think I would want to know if I were in the market for this kind of car. And what I can tell you with this is you won't be disappointed. Unless you're planning on tracking it every single weekend, in which case uh, I, just, I can't really advise because I don't know what I'm talking about. But if you just want a nice, luxurious car that's still good fun when you want to give it a blast on some country roads on the weekend, you really can't go wrong. Before I bought my MG GT, I did briefly consider one of these, but I dismissed it as just being a, a boring businessman's car. And I kind of wish now that I'd driven one. It's just sublime, honestly. It is sublime. That's 6,000 RPM. And pop it back into comfort and everything goes tame and civilised again. Something else that surprised me is the ride quality. I expected this to be a, a big, soft, floaty blancmange, and it isn't. It's actually quite firm. Not uncomfortably so, but you do feel all the bumps in the road, and I wasn't expecting that. Having said that, compared to my MG GT, this rides like a Rolls Royce Wraith. But it's just a reminder that the LC is set up for speed and performance, not just comfort. In typical Lexus fashion though, the seats are incredibly comfortable and supportive and everything you touch or look at is wrapped in the finest leather or suede. The steering wheel feels like pure quality, and it's heated. It's the attention to detail though that's staggering. It's very, very nearly Bentley quality. Take for example the screws they've used on the door cards. They've got the word Lexus scribed into them. And look at the centre armrest. You open it, and then to close it, it's got a soft close feature. It's things like that that just remind you Lexus have really thought of absolutely everything. If they put that much effort into the sensor console, imagine how much effort they've put into the engine and the gearbox. I should point out that this is just a standard LC500. You could have opted for a Sport model or a Sport Plus, and that got things like bigger wheels, rear wheel steering, and a limited slip diff. But, <laughs> I, I don't know, I, I shouldn't really comment because I haven't driven either of those models, but I wouldn't personally need any more than this. I'm told both of those models will be more engaging, but for 90% of the public, who cares? I honestly think this is sporty enough for most people. It's comfortable enough for most people. And it's certainly fast enough for most people. I think as GT cars go, Lexus have got the balance just right. You know, something like a, an S-Class Coupe or a Mercedes CL or a Bentley GT, they're too far the other way. They're too opulent, too luxurious, too much like being in your own disconnected bubble. Or then the other side of the coin, you've got something like my AMG GT or a Porsche 911 that are too loud, too raw, too uncomfortable. Whereas the LC500 straddles both those worlds. In terms of practicality, you do get two rear seats back there, but outside of a maternity ward, I've never actually met a human being that would fit. But as is often the case with two plus twos, they're just handy for storing extra things. 
weekend bags, coats, jackets, that sort of thing. Most commentators have criticised the boot space for being ridiculously small at only 197 litres. And the hybrid offers even less space. But to be honest, for this kind of car, does it really matter? I'm not sure it does. Whoever buys this kind of car, this isn't going to be your only car. So you'll just make it work. It isn't big enough for two sets of golf clubs, which I honestly think is quite a good thing. Up front there's plenty of space. Plenty of headroom, plenty of legroom, plenty of elbow room. I've got a nice, wide, comfortable centre console here. The layout of everything is just perfect. I could get used to this car, you know. It's a bit of me, this. The interior in general is a sight to behold. The quality and choice of materials is just superb. You often hear people say, oh, it's like being in a cockpit. And you just roll your eyes, because what that really means is it's got five or six more buttons than their old Mark V Golf. But this genuinely does feel like you're in a cockpit. But the cockpit of a spacecraft. It's incredible, this. I love how the infotainment screen blends almost seamlessly into the dash. And I love the analog clock. In typical Lexus fashion, the infotainment system is quite fiddly to use. You get this annoying little trackpad here, which is impossible to use, unless you're 11. But ultimately, the quality of everything just shines through. If you're a bit of a geek, you'll probably recognise some buttons from the Toyota parts bin. For example, look at this gear lever. It's straight out of a Prius. Only they've tried to disguise it with more leather. But I'm sorry, you're not fooling anybody. Actually, to be fair, I actually quite like how it works. I've always been a fan of that joystick kind of design. You get plenty of storage in the door pockets, you get plenty of storage in the centre console, you get a decent sized glove compartment, but unfortunately there's only one cup holder. We should, I suppose, talk about reliability. Although this shouldn't take long, should it? If you service your Lexus every year at a Lexus main dealer, which I promise you will be a very pleasant experience, they'll bring you cappuccinos, and even when you pay your bill, they'll give you some Lexus branded sweets. They're always punctual and professional. Everybody else should really take note. Anyway, if you service it with them every year, Lexus will extend that warranty every single year for free until it's 10 years old. It's all part of their Lexus Relax warranty. What does that tell you about the brand? How much confidence have they got in their own products? In terms of this car's rivals, you could have bought a BMW 850i, a Aston Martin, a Mercedes AMG GT, a Mercedes S-Class Coupe, a Bentley, I suppose, a Maserati. But this is different from all of those. This offers something else extra. I thought before I'd driven it, this thing would miss the mark, but it really doesn't. I thought this is a car that you'd only buy with your head and not your heart. But in truth, this thing will satisfy your heart too. As is often the case with big, expensive, luxurious coupes like this, depreciation is a killer. Well, I say a killer, it's a killer if you buy it new, but it's great if you're like me and you want to pick one up cheap second hand. Pre-COVID, you could pick these things up for under 50,000 pounds, which is such a bargain. I know it's not exactly sock drawer money, but when you think about what you get, it's a hell of a lot of car for the money. Most of this car's rivals that I've just mentioned will cost you half as much again, and I don't think they're half as much better. Even in today's uncertain, weird market, a nice hybrid will set you back around 55 grand, and a nice V8 petrol like this will set you back around 65. Something else I like about this car is its rarity. I've just driven through Old Liège Village and it still turns heads. You hardly ever see these cars on the roads, which I think is a crying shame. I think they're one of the best kept secrets of the motoring world. Well, thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll leave the link below. If you've got any comments or questions, let me know below and I'll do my best to get back to you. If you're interested in getting into the used car business, then do check out my online course. I've created an online platform with nearly 100 videos which explain every single aspect of the used motor trade. Where to start, funding options, how to buy stock, branding, everything you could possibly wish to know is there. So do check it out. So yeah, cheers guys. Until next time, see you later.